Here's the last lesson for the Calculus and Vectors course. This is lesson seven, Intersections of Planes. I'm going to divide this lesson into a couple different parts. The first part, we're going to look at how two planes can intersect. There are a few different scenarios for what could happen. In order to complete this lesson, you're going to have to remember, first of all, how to write the scalar equation of a plane, what a normal vector is, and also you're going to have to remember how to write the vector and parametric equations of a line in three space using both its position vector and direction vector. All right, let's complete the first part of this lesson where we're going to be finding the intersection of two planes. Now let me just scroll and show you what the questions will look like. I'm going to give you the scalar equations of two planes, and I'm going to ask you to describe how those planes in each pair intersect. Before we learn how to do that algebraically, it might be useful for you to know the three scenarios for what could happen. If the planes are not parallel to each other, like in this scenario, they're going to intersect in a line. We say they have a line of intersection, and I'll teach you how to find the equation of that line of intersection. If the two planes are parallel to each other, they are either parallel and coincident, meaning the planes lay right on top of each other and they're in fact the same plane and therefore there are an infinite number of solutions, or the planes are parallel and distinct, meaning they are apart from each other and they never intersect, meaning there would be no solutions to that system of two planes. Now let me walk you through how are we going to know, first of all, if the planes that we have in the question, like if we look at this question, example 1a, how are we going to know if those two planes are parallel? We're going to have to first of all remember what a normal vector is. A normal vector is a vector that is perpendicular to the entire surface of a plane. If I were to look at the normal vectors for the parallel and distinct vectors, let me draw a normal vector to this one here. I will call that normal one. And then if I were to draw a normal vector to the second plane, I'll draw a vector perpendicular to its surface. Notice, how do those two normal vectors compare? Well, because the planes are parallel, their normals are also going to be parallel. So we'll look at the normal vectors, and we'll notice, are those normal vectors parallel or not? If they are parallel, that tells us the planes are parallel. And then we know we either have parallel and distinct planes or parallel and coincident planes. If our normal vectors, like in this scenario, I'll draw a normal vector here and a normal vector to the second plane, notice those two normal vectors are definitely not parallel to each other. That's because the planes aren't parallel to each other. So let me read to you the process we are going to go through. When solving a system of two planes, we're gonna check if the planes are parallel by analyzing their normal vectors like I just showed you. If they are parallel, determine if they are coincident, meaning they have an infinite number of solutions, or if they're distinct, meaning they have no solutions. If the normals are not parallel, that means that the planes are not parallel either. And we'll find the line of intersection by, number one, eliminate a variable using the method of elimination. Number two, choose one of the remaining variables to be the parameter t. So we're setting a free variable. I'll explain to you what that means and why we're doing it when we do an example. And then number three, we will then write the other two variables in terms of that parameter t so that we get the parametric equations of the line of intersection. So let's look at example 1a and let's go ahead and try and figure out how we can do this. It may be useful for you, first of all, to remember that the scalar equation of a plane looks like this, where the coefficients a, b, and c correspond with a vector that is perpendicular to the surface of the plane, and we call that the normal vector. So if we have the coefficients of x, y, z, that is our normal vector. So let me just get rid of this, and let's go ahead and write the normal vector of both of these planes, and then compare them. So our first normal vector I'm getting from plane number one. If I look at the coefficients, I see that it is two, negative one, one. And normal vector 2, I'm getting from plane number 2, looking at the coefficients of x, y, and z, I see they are 1, 1, and 1. Now we also have to remember that if vectors are parallel to each other, they would be scalar multiples of each other. So is there a number that I can multiply all the components of normal 2 by to make it equal to normal 1? Well, if I multiply the x component by 2, 
I get 2. But if I multiply the y component by 2, I don't get negative 1. Therefore, I can say that normal 1 is not a scalar multiple of normal 2. So I know that those normals are not parallel, which means that the planes are not parallel to each other either. This means that they intersect in a line. Now, when they intersect in a line, I told you the three steps we're going to do, the first of which is we eliminate a variable using the method of elimination. So when using elimination, we want either the x's, y's, or z's to have the same coefficient, and then we'll add or subtract the equations to eliminate one of the variables. In this question, it would be easy to eliminate either the y's or the z's, since their coefficients already have the same absolute value. So I'm just going to rewrite the equations on top of each other. And notice I move the constant terms to the right of the equal sign. You don't have to do that, but I typically do that when solving using elimination. And now if I'm going to eliminate the y's, because their coefficients have opposite signs, adding the two equations will eliminate that variable. So when I add all of the like terms, I get 3x plus the y's eliminate plus 2z equals 7. Now when we have two planes and when we do elimination, we get two variables left. That tells me that the two planes intersect in a line. I knew from analyzing their normals that they were going to intersect in a line. But it's also useful to know that this algebraic answer confirms that for us. These are going to intersect in a line. Now you are going to have to remember how do we write the equation of a line in 3-space? Well, we can't use a scalar equation in 3-space for a line because that's what we use for planes we need to use either a vector or parametric equations of the line. So let me just write those out for you just so you remember what those look like. And then we'll figure out how we're going to get those for this line of intersection. So I've written both the vector and parametric equations of a line in three space, what they look like, the general template. Now, as a reminder, the key parts of these equations are a position vector the x, y, and z knots, which we see there and there, and the direction vector, the m1, m2, m3, that we see there and there. Those are the key things we need to know about a line, a position vector that points to a point on the line, and a direction vector that shows us the direction of the line. Now, how are we going to get those from the equations that we have here in red? Well, if we look at step two here, it says choose one of the remaining variables, and I see that we have both an x and a z left to be the parameter t. So if we were to say let z equal t, essentially what we're doing is we are making, if we look down at the very bottom here, we are making the z component of the position vector, we're making that 0, and the z component of the direction vector, we're making that 1. So I could replace those in the vector equation for you as well, just so you can see that. And then what we're going to do now that we know what z is equal to in terms of t, we can then use that relationship to solve for what x and y are equal to in terms of t. Now we didn't have to make the z components of the position and direction vector be 0 and 1. We could have made them anything we want. We could have made it z equals 20 plus 99t and then solved for x and y accordingly. And we would get a correct line of intersection. But it's just easiest if we just say let z equal t. So let me erase all this and we'll go ahead and do that. So if z equals t, I can look at this equation I've made here, I'll call it equation three, and I can sub z equals t into equation three. I would have three x plus two t equals seven, and then isolate x. 3x equals 7 minus 2t. Divide the 3 over x equals 7 thirds minus 2 thirds t. So if we are writing the parametric equations of the line that they intersect in, I already have the x equation and the z equation. All I have left to do is solve for the y equation. So I could take what I know z is equal to and x is equal to in terms of t, and then sub those into either uh, the x and z of equation 2, or the x and z of equation one, and then solve for y. It wouldn't matter which of those two we chose. So I'll write down what we're doing. I think I'll sub it into equation two, which was x plus y plus z equals six. So replace x with 7 thirds minus 2 thirds t. 
plus y plus we know z is equal to t. And now I just have to isolate the y. So if I put my like terms together here, negative two thirds t plus a whole t, that gives me a third of a t. So I have a third of a t plus y equals six minus, I'm gonna bring that seven thirds over. I'm going to need a common denominator. So I'm gonna change that six to 18 thirds. And I have y equals 11 thirds minus one third t. So I have my parametric equations of the line of intersection. Let me just say the line of intersection is z was equal to t, x was equal to 7 thirds minus 2 thirds t, and y was equal to 11 thirds minus 1 third t. And I could write the corresponding vector equation of this line by saying x, y, z equals, take the components of the position vector by looking at the constant terms, 7 thirds, 11 thirds, and nothing. 11 thirds, zero, plus t times the components of the direction vector, which were negative two thirds, negative one third, and one. Now a direction vector, which is this vector here, should always be simplified, meaning we shouldn't have any fractions and it should be reduced. I see fractions, let's get rid of those fractions by multiplying that direction vector. Let's multiply this whole vector here. Let's multiply it by, and that leaves me with a final answer of x, y, z equals 7 thirds, <coughs> 11 thirds zero plus t times negative two, negative one, three. Let me just highlight this answer. And that is our line of intersection. So every point that makes up that line would satisfy the equation of both of the planes. So that is our answer for this system. Let me just show you what this looks like in Desmos. So here are the two planes. Notice if we compare their normal vectors, which I just popped onto the screen there, those normal vectors are clearly not parallel to each other, which is what told us that the planes were not parallel, which is what told us that they intersect in this black line that, that you just saw come onto the screen there. All right, let's move on to part B. Once again, I have the scalar equation of two planes. Let's start by looking at their normal vectors and that will hopefully tell us what scenario we have. So if I look at plane three, the normal vector of plane three is two, negative six, four, and the normal vector of plane four is three, negative nine, six. Now those normal vectors, if they are parallel to each other, they will be scalar multiples of each other. And hopefully you can see that if we were to multiply normal vector three by one and a half, it would be exactly equal to normal vector four. Multiply each of those components by one and a half and it'll give us the components of normal vector four. So because they're scalar multiples of each other, we know that those normal vectors are parallel to each other, which means that therefore the planes are parallel to each other. Now, if we look back to the original three scenarios, the fact that they're parallel, that tells us that we have either parallel and coincident, they're the same plane with infinite solutions or parallel and distinct, they're uh, separate planes that never intersect and therefore no solutions. How are we gonna tell which of those two scenarios we have? Well, there's a few different things we could do, but I think the easiest thing to do would be start trying to solve using elimination and then interpret the answer we get after we eliminate a variable. So we're going to want either the X's, Y's, or Z's to have the same coefficient. Uh, if I were to multiply plane three by one and a half, the X's, Y's, and Z's will all have the same coefficient. So let's go ahead and do that. And I can just leave the equation of plane four exactly as it is. And now because the coefficients have the same sign, I'm going to subtract to eliminate. The X's will eliminate, the Y's will eliminate, and the Z's will eliminate. That's what happens when the planes are parallel. But the important thing is going to be what happens to the constant terms. Negative 10 and a half minus negative two is negative eight and a half. So we have negative eight and a half on the left side of the equation and nothing on the right. So the equation we're left with after eliminating a variable is negative eight and a half equals zero, which we know can never be true. Negative eight and a half cannot equal zero. 
which means there is no set of x, y, z values that will satisfy both equations. The planes must be parallel and distinct from each other. So our final answer will be there are no solutions, the planes are parallel and distinct. And let me just show you what this would look like in GeoGebra. So here are our two planes. We analyzed their normal vectors and noticed that the normal vectors were parallel, which means the planes are parallel. And then we saw that those two planes, in fact, never touch each other. There are no solutions. There are no points that fall on both of the planes. Let's move on to the last example in this first part of our lesson. Once again, the scalar equation of two planes. Let's start by comparing their normal vectors. So from plane five, the coefficients of x, y, and z are one, one, negative two. And for plane six, the coefficients of x, y, and z are two, two, negative four. So that's easy to find their normals. And it should be pretty obvious for this one that if I were to multiply normal five by two, it would be exactly equal to normal six. Right, each of those components from normal five multiplied by two would give us the components of normal six. That tells us that those normals are scalar multiples of each other, which means the normals are parallel, which means the planes are parallel. But are they parallel and distinct or parallel and coincident? Let's start using elimination to figure out what happens. So let's make the x's have the same coefficients by multiplying uh, the equation of plane five by two to give me two x plus two y minus four z plus four equals zero. And I can just leave the equation of plane six the way it is. And notice these two equations are the exact same. When I do subtraction to eliminate the x's, in fact, everything eliminates. The x's are gone, the y's are gone, the z's are gone, and even the constants are gone. So on the left, I'm left with nothing. And on the right, I have nothing. So I have an equation, zero equals zero, which tells me that the two equations I did elimination with were in fact the same equation. So the question gave us the same plane twice, which means the planes are parallel and coincident, right? Zero is always equal to zero, so when we get that, we know there are an infinite number of solutions. Every point that lies on plane five is also on plane six. So there's an infinite number of x, y, z values that satisfy both equations. So that's it for the first part of this lesson where we're finding the intersection of two planes. You now know all three scenarios that could happen and algebraically how you can tell which of those scenarios you have. Make sure you watch the next video as well where I'm going to go through how we find the solution to a system of three planes. Jensen, man.